So I hereby declare that Rees Marvin Jonathan is duly elected. So what can we expect from Marvin Rees? What sort of mayor will he be and can he keep to his election promises? In his first Made in Bristol TV interview since being sworn in as mayor of Bristol, Marvin Rees told me, well, the hard work starts now. Yeah, it does. Uh, well, it started today, absolutely. Um, you saw on stage, we had a number of people join me on stage. Deborah from Health, Steve from Education and Business, John from uh, Police. That's starting out the, the way we mean to go on. Yeah, I mean, when you talk uh, and you're full of motivation, yeah, you, you've, you've grown up with all of this, but you've got to make it happen. Yeah. And that is very difficult. How are you going to succeed where others have failed in bringing equality and giving people homes who need them and giving the right education to kids who need it? It's easily said, yeah. but it's desperately difficult to achieve. It is. I think the key is finding fantastic people in the city who, and releasing them to deliver. Um, I've already identified, which we'll share with you soon, a, a lead for housing. Um, I've been approached today by uh, someone from primary education as well, and we're talking about how we are going to deliver for the mental health for children and young people. Uh, we heard today on stage about the, the critical importance of integrating um, acute health services and, and adult social care as well. You know, people are coming forward and saying, I know how to do this, let me work with you. And what I want to do is, is create the space and release them to go ahead and make that. And this is doable, is it? Because everybody wants to make that achievement. Yeah don't they? But uh, you, you've kind of put your neck on the block in a way. It, it, it's kind of what you've put your mayoral ship on over yeah. the next four years. Yeah, I have, and it focuses minds, hopefully. You know, it's certainly focused my mind. So our housing target is mm. doable, but it's also aspirational. 2,000 homes a year. 2,000 homes a year by 2020. So we build the capacity over the coming years to be able to deliver that, identifying the land, drawing in the developers, local, regional and national developers who are going to come and work with us. And you've priced that, that up. You've worked that out. You've talked to the relevant people. We, we've started those relationships. Even a number of those people are in the room today that we've been working with, uh, working with over the over the last uh, eight or nine months to talk about Bristol's capacity. A number of the people that have said they want to get things done in Bristol but uh, about the, the bureaucracy, the, the complexity of a local decision maker has not allowed them to do that. So what I want to do, what I'm going to find the leaders to do is enable people to really cut through that, the, the, those blockages. Yeah, you, you, you're also very gracious to George Ferguson. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of sparring going on, of course there was, across the past number of years. Will you be building on the foundations that he has built? Will you be acknowledging that he has left perhaps this city in a fairly good state and something that you can build on? without perhaps destroying a lot of what he's already put in place? I'm not, not intending to destroy anything, uh, absolutely not. We, we, differed, our zones. we differed in our priorities. Uh, well, that, I mean, destroy them, you want to well, review uh, them and say how you make them work. Re review them and get rid of them. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm not talking about blanket review. I think a lot of people are saying they understand that they actually make sense in certain zones, mm. particularly outside schools or mm. narrow res but, but residential But talking streets. more generally, you, yeah. you, you get my point. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, where, where things are going well, I'm not coming in and saying, right, everything's, everything's been bad, we're not doing that. Uh, but, but my emphasis, uh, my, my point has been, I think that perhaps we haven't had the right priorities. I think we focused on an outward story, and I think we uh, focused on uh, you know, a city that enjoys itself and has fun, and that's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. But there's some kind of what you might call meat and potato issues, such as affordability, tackling inequality, educational inequalities, health inequalities, mm -hmm. um, that actually underpin the future of our, our success and our prosperity. If we don't get those mm -hmm. right, then there is no prosperous future for Bristol. And Marvin, as far as you being an idealist and, and a thinker, and I've called you that before, and, that, and that's what you are, you're, you're motivated to do all of this. How much will you be allowed to do this, bearing in mind the political system as it is? There's an overwhelming majority for Labour. It's a Labour city now. What's going to be the difference between you as a, as, as a mayor and perhaps you as a leader of the Labour Council? Almost what went before. But what, what, what's the difference in the role? Well, I hope it will be a, 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 a seamless movement. Now, actually, the people on stage with me today, the mayor does not have command and control power. Over them. That's the way cities work. They're interdependent. You have the universities, they're their own organisations. You have the health services. I, 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 I understand that, but, but you effectively could just be the leader of the Labour Council. Yeah, and that's not good enough. Yeah. The mayor is not there to lead the Labour Party. It's not lead to, there to lead the, the council. It's there, as was pointed out from one of my uh, friends on stage today, it's there to create the space for all those organisations to come together, identify and share city priorities. Bristol will flourish 
when the police are working effectively with housing strategy, mm. when, when our universities are using their research and their expertise to make sure we have evidence-based policy, that we're measuring the impact of the, the plans we put in place and the policies we put in place. That's, that's the kind of Bristol that will really flourish when people are able to bring their expertise to the table. And the mayoral offer is, a, a number of mayors have, have suggested to me, it's not command and control, it's convene and ask. It's make the space for you to be able to flourish. Yeah, and as far as external, perhaps the Labour Party, we, we talked uh, before your election about Jeremy Corbyn, you were up close and personal, you said that he's had a big influence on you. How much help did he give you no, in I this said campaign? I said he's offered me lots of support. Yeah. I didn't say the word big influence on me. But I said he, yeah, yeah, as far as yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, lots so of people. That's the wrong word. But yeah. he, he supported you. Absolutely. How did he do that? Well, he came down, supported me. He was very personally encouraging. Um, even even after my selection, he sent me a text, you know, which is which I, I I found you know great. And I and I just think knowing that he was absolutely committed to me winning uh, was a real um, a real uh, piece of inspiration. And and I heard that not just from Jeremy directly, but from other people, MPs that came to visit, yeah. said you know Jeremy's really serious about supporting you in Bristol. And that was about clearly it's about Labour, but it wasn't just about Labour. I think he's also recognised my own personal journey and where yeah. I've come from and that's important to him and that's important to the legacy of the Labour Party. But does it worry you in some ways, I mean you almost talked like an independent before but attached to the Labour Party when people said you're a Labour mayoral candidate, you said I'm a Bristol mayoral candidate who happens to be Labour. They, the Labour Party has obviously invested large sums of money, George Ferguson called it a juggernaut, uh, you've got the Labour out to vote for you and so on. They'll want some return on that investment. Do you feel in any way that you, you might be compromised in any way in what you want to do in Bristol because of that? No, I kind of almost reject the premise of your questioning. You in know, what way? Well, I mean, the idea that I just have to be labor, return on investment. I mean, what do we think that return on investment is? That's what I'm asking you. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have used the phrase. Why did you use the phrase? Well, I used the phrase because uh, it's obviously been good for the Labour Party, yeah. for Jeremy Corbyn, to get four Labour mayors in. It, it, it's helped him a great deal. Uh, you're a Labour Mayor, what I'm asking you is how much independence. Right. If, well, if, there's, if there's a pie yeah, chart, yeah. you know, okay, that investment's okay. quite a bit, isn't it? <laughs> okay, well, let me just say there is not a group of Labour people hovering on the borders of Bristol waiting to invade because now I'm mayor saying, Let, can we have something back, right? Yeah. That's, it doesn't yeah. work like that. Yeah. They've been supporting me. I'm Marvin Rees. I ran with the support of the Labour Party. I'm a member of the Labour Party because I, I share values with them about the priority on inclusion, diversity, tackling inequality, building a strong economy that benefits everyone, not just a few. So, so that's, that's our common ground and we work together around that. But also, like all of us, we're all multidimensional. Yeah. I'm a member of the Labour Party. I'm also, I'm also a guy who grew up in Bristol. I'm a mixed race. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a son. All these things inform what, uh, who and, and, and what we are. And, and the reason I, I, I struggle with that is because it, it, it sounds like, here's the box. Can I fit in the box? And yeah. no, I can't. You're never going to do that. No. And, and, and to be honest, none of us do. Yeah. Let me just ask you this then, vision-wise, four years down the line, maybe even eight years, who knows? What kind of a Bristol is it going to be in four years, Marvin, if, if, if all goes well for you? How, do you? how do you see this city in four years' time? Yeah, it's really good. A friend of mine emailed me last night and just said, write down the five things, and I wrote down nine or something. <laughs> write down the five things you want to be able to, top to, to say. Yeah, it's actually a former boss of yours. <laughs> um, clearly, I want, I want Bristol to be a place in which people can afford to live, and I want it to be a city in which they can find homes to live in. I want people to have a, have a hope that they will be able to, uh, a genuine hope, rather than the, the decreasing hope at the moment that people feel uh, uh, you know, about Bristol. And I want there to be, I want us to have, um, really made headroads in saying that you know we are making uh, making good progress on tackling inequalities um, in the city. I mean, this is no longer a left field issue for a few uh, activists. This is a central issue: how we build a strong economy that benefits everyone, not just a few. And I'd love to use the expertise in our universities across all our institutions to break the link between our backgrounds, our socio-economic background, and our prospects in life. Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist, says <laughs> the most. Always got a quote. Yeah. What he says is a very challenging quote for us. He said, the most important decision you can make to influence your life decisions or who your parents are. Yeah. You know, we have to stop that. That's the ultimate injustice. When it's not your talent, it's not your hard work, it's your background. And I want Bristol to be a city that can tell a story to the world about how we broke that link. Good luck with it, Marvin. Thanks very much. Good.